when the train approached. Jones was unable to get off the tracks in time. Seven others were hurt. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Kevin Holmes. Jennifer is on assignment. We have in-depth coverage of this still developing story tonight. We have confirmed new details. I just got off the phone about an hour ago with the senior editor for Variety Magazine. He has confirmed to us that production of the Midnight Rider film has been halted and crew members are returning home to L.A. Variety has also confirmed to us that lead actor William Hurt was on the train tracks when the crash occurred and that cameras were rolling at the time of the collision. Johnson has spoken to crew members and says they are still understandably shaken up. It's something that is replaying in their head uh, over and over again. That's how one of the, uh, the crew members I talked to uh, uh, described it. I asked the question, you know, are you ready to go back uh, to uh, this film? And they said, uh, under no terms do I want to go back to the movie. We really see this as uh, uh, a, a chance to really talk about uh, some of the problems that there are, there are with onset safety. We are working for you tonight, following up on some of the ways our local film community is ensuring this tragedy never happens again. We begin with WJCL's Rob Mako. The local film community is a tight-knit group. They often work with crews from the southeast, New York, and California. Sarah Jones' death has hit many of them hard. This past week has been incredibly tough for the entire film community. It's been extremely emotional and very sad. Sarah Jones was no stranger to Savannah. She'd worked here as an assistant camera operator on several occasions. Rebecca Etheridge works in front of and behind the camera on movies and TV shows. She says Jones succeeded in the male-dominated realm of camera operators. She seems to have gained a lot of respect from people who have been in that department for many years who are vetted cameramen, which speaks volume, I think, for her talent. Mark Ezra Stokes, president of Savannah Filmmakers, says Jones' death has prompted his group to host an educational seminar next month about safety on the set. It will be open to film crews from the southeast. One of the things that this incident has shown the Savannah film community is we're not alone in this. The, the southeast film community is very well connected. Carla Schindler is a local set designer. She's with a group called Savannah Women in Film and Television, or SWIFT. SWIFT called an emergency meeting Wednesday night to talk about safety. It will make us more aware of um, when production companies come in maybe to ask more questions and, and not be afraid to speak up. The Midnight Rider film was being produced by the California-based Unclaimed Freight Productions. The company also produced the movie CBGB and the film Savannah. It was using space inside Medden Studios and renting equipment. Some say Medden and Savannah are being unfairly blamed for the tragedy in some news reports and on social media. I really do think that people are putting down the Georgia industry of film and not really knowing behind the scenes of this specific project that this is not a Georgia-based production company. I have reached out to Unclaimed Freight Productions and Medden Studios. They have not responded to my requests for comment. Rob Manco, WJCL News, working for you. Meanwhile, a memorial for Sarah Jones, the 27-year-old crew member killed in the tragedy on the trestle last week. Well, it wrapped up a few hours ago. Our own Ashley Lincoln was there, and she's been following this story from the start. She has more from Columbia, South Carolina. I'm in Columbia, South Carolina, where family and friends of Sarah Jones say today was a very difficult day as they all had to prepare to say their goodbyes. Home for Sarah Elizabeth Jones is in her family's hearts in Columbia, South Carolina. She was born just minutes away from Ashland United Methodist Church, where Friday, family, friends, and industry professionals came together in honor of Sarah's life. This afternoon, we're going to celebrate Sarah's life. Described as a woman who loved life and lived it to the fullest, Sarah made international trips to Amsterdam, Italy, and France. But all knew her true love in life was her passion for film. If we could look through the camera lens at her life for just a few moments and view this feature biography that was her life. It's through that lens a mourning father reflects on the last time he played for his daughter. I call it simply Andy's song. <clears throat> that was the last time I played for my dear Sarah. 
I will play a new song for my daughter's final sleep. Those close to Sarah didn't want to go on camera, but say even as a young child, Sarah always had a camera in her hands. Her career was her passion, from her first day at an internship on the set of Army Wives to the last day of her life. And I spoke to two crew members who were actually on scene and got injured at the time of the train accident, but for obvious reasons, they were too shaken up to share any words about Sarah. We are respecting those wishes. But for now, reporting in Columbia, South Carolina, Ashley Lincoln for WJCO News, working for you. The outpouring continues as film colleagues across the U.S. pay tribute to Sarah Jones by starting Slates for Sarah. As of tonight, there are about 36,000 likes on Facebook. And check this image out. One of the members put together this mosaic of Sarah made up of all the pictures of the movie slates the film industry has been submitting to remember Sarah. It's truly amazing. There is also an effort underway to get Sarah's name on the memorial segment for this Sunday's Oscars. Supporters are asking folks to sign an online petition to try and make this happen. Right now, the group has almost reached its goal of 32,000 signatures. The petition will be submitted for consideration by the Academy by Friday at 10 a.m. A Bluffton High School student could spend more than 20 years in prison. Court officials there tell us the teen pleaded guilty to bringing several guns and knives to school today. In addition to the weapons, officers say last May, Austin Almeida brought gasoline, lighter fluid, and a lighter on campus. Almeida is expected to be sentenced the week of April 21st. He is expected to undergo a psychological review before then. The woman at the center of the Metro Police scandal has now been indicted. Trina Mays has been charged with seven counts of lying to police. WJCL's Renee LaSalle has been on top of this story from the start and joins us now with the latest. Renee? Kevin, this is a story with a lot of history. Today, a Chatham County grand jury decided there was enough evidence against former officer Trina Mays to indict. This comes more than five months after Mays filed a sexual harassment claim against then police chief Willie Lovett. Now, no one would speak on camera today, but the charges stem from a relationship Mays had more than seven years ago. Seven counts of making a false statement. That's the indictment handed down Wednesday against former Metro Police Officer Trina Mays. The grand jury returned a true bill on charges the eight-year Metro veteran had lied to investigators about her involvement with convicted felon Rocky Sellers and also lied to Interim Chief Julie Tolbert and City Manager Stephanie Cutter when she made an appeal trying to keep her job. Mays had been fired when an outside investigation found she hadn't been truthful about her 2006 relationship with Sellers during an internal affairs investigation. Officers are prohibited from associating with known criminals. Mays' defense attorney, Richard Darden, issued this statement. These allegations were fully investigated in 2007, and there was no evidence of any wrongdoing on the part of my client. Now, Mays must go before a jury of her peers to make that case. Now, Mays' attorney in her civil suit against the city and the Metro Police Department has consistently claimed that this new investigation is retaliation because she filed that sexual harassment complaint. Now, Kevin, Mays is expected to turn herself in to Metro Police to face these charges. All right, Renee, thanks. Thank you. Club Dosha's doors are still locked after Savannah City Manager shut the nightclub down, this following a violent weekend that left two people shot. Now some businesses fear it will hurt foot traffic nearby. Dolce's alcohol license has been revoked and closed for the time being. After a fight broke out Sunday morning, a 25-year-old man and a 19-year-old woman were both shot about a block away. Nearby business owners fear the incident could deter people from Broughton Street. It might be just, you know, focus on one business, but one bad apple you know, creates a problem for the whole bunch. Joyner, president of Savannah's Downtown Business Association, said he supports the city's decision to shut down the club. He believes it will not negatively impact Broughton Street businesses. We have some road closures in the low country to tell you about. Highway 278, both eastbound and westbound, will be closed for the next month. This will be between Buckingham Plantation Drive and the bridges to Hilton Head Island through March 28th. It will be from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. 
Crews are working on the road to widen it in the future. Drivers should also expect delays as crews and equipment will be in that area. Still to come, American Idol is in full swing, so we sat down with our local contestants who made it to Hollywood. Department of Health leaders in South Carolina say more than 300 people were exposed to hepatitis A this after eating at a low country restaurant February 15th. Now they're trying to get in contact with those customers before it's too late. Low Country Bureau Chief Larry Spruill is working for you tonight and has information you need to know. Larry, this is a pretty big deal. It is, Kevin, and they say time is of the essence right now in order to get a handle on the possible exposure before it's too late. Reeling in a spot to park in front of Hudson Seafood is a pretty slim chance any day of the week. But this week, fewer people are taking the bait due to word getting out about an employee testing positive for hepatitis A. There are about 320 people who um, had a, a meal there in the time frame that we're interested in. Employees at South Carolina Department of Environmental Control are trying to get in contact with those 300 plus customers before it's too late. We have attempted to notify all of the patrons that we're aware of who ate in the restaurant. Dr. Linda Bell says hepatitis A is one of several viruses that causes inflammation of the liver. You can get the virus through direct contact with someone that has a disease or consuming food or beverage that were contaminated. That's exactly what happened at Hudson Seafood. Hudson's owner says the employee was traveling before returning back to work here on February 15th. That's why DHEC says they are only concerned about customers that came to the restaurant on that day during the hours of 4 to closing. We're recommending that they be um, treated with preventive um, vaccine. And Bell says in order for the vaccines to be effective, they must be inside the body during the incubation period for the disease. Once you become in contact with the virus, there's an incubation period of about two weeks to 50 days before you become ill. If we offer the vaccine prior to the earliest incubation period, which is two weeks, then we can prevent people from developing the infection. Again, if you ate at Hudson's only on February 15th, then you should contact DHEC. That number is 1-800-868-0404. Again, that number is one 800 Eight six eight zero four zero four and D Hex says, well, if you go past a two weeks probation period, then your chances of actually having the disease increases. Wow. All right. Thank you, Larry. Mm -hmm.